Uh, yeah, Kenny, boy, a few things to talk about today, I guess. But first of all, uh, thanks for coming on, man. I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time. I'm an MMA and UFC junkie, and uh, it's a real treat to get the opportunity to speak with you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, man. Um, so, you know, just for those people, before we crack into the, all the excitement, for the people that aren't familiar with you, why don't uh, you go with the, the, the brief intro to yourself, and then we'll get it kicked off. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I started in martial arts as a kid. Um, m my father uh, is a physician and um, he did judo throughout, uh, you know, his high school and, and college and medical school years and kind of wanted us all to kind of learn martial arts. So everyone in my family, I'm one of six and we all learned martial arts growing up and I was into other sports and things and uh, kind of reunited um, with martial arts when I was at Boston College playing soccer and um, was just fascinated by it. There was this revolutionary thing called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, this family from Brazil had kind of uh, revolutionized martial arts and their approach to it. Uh, that fascinated me uh, because more than anything else, it was working in real hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and uh, I just got hooked on, on that. Ended up uh, after college, uh, was working at a translation agency, uh, translating uh, financial documents and things, and um, had a near-death experience in Brazil. I fell off a cliff headfirst, somehow landed onto a ledge. If I didn't fall onto that ledge, it would have been really bad. And um, that kind of inspired me to say, hey, life is short. Uh, I love this thing called martial arts. I'm just going to dedicate myself to that, not knowing what the future uh, really would, would hold for me. Uh, left my job, uh, ended up getting divorced uh, uh, about six months after that. Uh, I was married young. I was like 23. Uh, and um, my whole life changed after that. And, you know, my parents are just like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? How are you going to make money in martial arts? You're supposed to go to law school after your job and, um, and ended up, uh, you know, becoming uh, a career. I, I became a professional fighter, ended up uh, in the UFC. And, after that, uh, did TV work and became a, an analyst for ESPN and Fox Sports and uh, has led to a bunch of other things that I do from podcasts to, you know, um, mixed martial arts gyms. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's been a wild ride. Jesus, that's a lot of ground to cover. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> and uh, you're a humble guy, Kenny. You, for those that don't know your career, you fought for the title in the 145 and 55 pound divisions in UFC three times, right? Yes. Which is uh, a pretty, pretty amazing accomplishment. Um, you know, you, I hadn't heard that um, story about the near death experience before. One of the things that I'd like to ask you is, you know, first about that experience, I'd, I'd love to hear more about just what the impact of that experience was, but as it seems to have led to you being able to make a commitment to martial arts. And, you know, I think, we all are, you know, get put through kind of the industrial education complex system, right? And we, we get kind of it's a, a cookie cutter approach to developing as, you know, free thinking individuals or not so free thinking individuals, you know, very kind of narrow in scope. And so we get spit out of that. And to go against the grain of what's kind of been placed in front of you, like the easy road, um, you know, being a contrarian, as it were, especially at a young age can be difficult, especially if you're not particularly rebellious. But if you just think like, you know, I, I don't particularly want to be an accountant for the rest of my life, right? I don't particularly don't want to be a fill in the blank. And I'd like to pursue something that gets me more excited, you know, that I find more interesting, that I, that I find more frightening, maybe. Um, and fighting in particular is one of those things, you know, and it's often said, like, you can't, have one foot in one foot out. I mean, if you're, if you're going to be a professional fighter with any sport, but in particular fighting, like, because correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to walk into that cage, pretty much accepting that you may die on that night. And because it's going to require so much of your will and determination to push to, you know, to that extent to, to perhaps come out victorious. And so I'm curious, both from the point of view of the near death experience and making that commit like that kind of switch in your brain and, and going against the grain what was it that allowed you to commit to something you know so extreme at such a young age yeah i think those are some spot-on observations i think um that's kind of exactly where i was in my life i was a kid that kind of did everything he was supposed to do for the most part uh, some rebellious phases but for the most part 
Um, I kind of followed along and uh, a little bit of the class clown, but uh, for the most part, I did what my parents told me to do and did what society told me to do and uh, went to went to college like a good boy and did everything. Was supposed to go on to law school and get the job that I was supposed to do as a as a doctor's son and all this stuff. And you know what? That near death experience when I fell off that mountain in Brazil. Um, I was there training at the time and, you know, I got married early. I had this, you know, job that I transitioned to after college. And after that, I said, you know, I'm not happy. What am I doing? I, I, I literally, as I was falling, it seemed like I was falling forever. And my whole life was just kind of flashing before my eyes. And I just got this um, overwhelming sense of sadness that I wasn't living my life. <laughs> and, uh, and that was horrible. Um, after that, I kind of had this quiet walk down the mountain. Me and my friends, you know, were just really quiet and just happy that no one died. Uh, and I knew something big was going to change. At the time, I was reading um, Jito Krishnamurti, uh, who is this philosopher uh, who is basically challenging everything that I believed in as a, uh, as a Catholic kid uh, growing up in Boston. And it was almost offensive reading all these things. And it was like, there was just so much, um, I don't know, confusion in my body and in my mind at the time. And I knew that something was going to change and it was going to be pretty drastic. And sure enough, um, my whole life did change a year later. I was now training as a, as a, as a martial artist. I, not, even, not even having mixed martial arts on the radar. I just thought I was going to teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu at the time. Uh, and then one thing led to another and, um, yeah, it, it just brought me into this whole new world and it, it was so satisfying going against the grain and, and finally feeling like I was being myself, like, uh, you know, um, so it was this spring thing, even, you know, looking at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which was so opposed to everything that martial arts, um, was about or what we thought was about, you know, we always thought the heavyweight champion of the world in boxing was the most dangerous guy on the planet. And he certainly is dangerous, but we didn't understand um, the value of ground fighting and the, and, and the value of uh, grappling. So even that was kind of one of those first aha moments, like, Hey, not everything you think it is, is what it is. Um, and that kind of really opened up my mind to all these other things and really started um, testing myself in, in, in that way. And, it was almost that sense of fear that I had about mixed martial arts and fighting that brought me into the space. That's, that's so interesting, man. You know, it, so often in life, blessings come in extremely uh, unexpected packages, you know, and to, you know, to w when, when you had that near death experience was the, was the change in how you were thinking, because one of the things that's so, you know, to bring it a little bit back to Bitcoin, which we will get to throughout the course of this discussion, but, you know, there's a few things I want to cover off first. But one of the great things about Bitcoin is that, you know, a lot of us are in this because of what it represents, you know, the contrast of what Bitcoin represents to the existing money system and political system, you know, that exists today. And we all want, we, we all believe in it because we think the world is going to be changed for the better as a result. But it's not lost on us that making that bet and seeing that and taking that risk earlier than the majority of the world is there's going to be financial benefit to accrue to the people that do that. And that, you know, that's fine. That's that's how it works. <clears throat> but one of the reasons why I'm so excited about that, and I talk about this a lot on the podcast, is because when you have that foundation of, of financial stability and freedom, when you're not so concerned about what comes next, how do you put food on the table, roof mm -hmm. over your head, that kind of stuff, you are actually in a far better position to make that choice, which you made as a young man and, and kudos to you for making it so young, but where you can say like, my life up till now hasn't really felt like me. Like I've been doing all this stuff because I've been told to, or because I needed to, or because I didn't really give much thought into it. But there's always been this nagging feeling like, I don't want to be fucking doing this. I want to be doing something else. And the fact that most people, uh, you know, avoid confronting that, that question or that sentiment a lot because uh, out of necessity. And when that necessity gets taken away and, you know, as Bitcoin's price goes up and I often, uh, you know, I like to think about Bitcoin's price action as in every thousand dollars, every $10,000 that Bitcoin goes up, people all over the world 
are able to be free on an individual level. Like they're able to opt out and say, okay, I don't need to work at the fill in the blank, you know, soul destroying job anymore. And I can actually pursue something that's meaningful to me. And as a result of doing that, we're seeing this amazingly vibrant culture emerge out of Bitcoin. And it's still super early days, but all these people that are becoming free and accessing greater degrees of freedom in their own life to express and emote who they genuinely are. And that's what, you know, I think that's why we're seeing this cultural renaissance almost in the Bitcoin space. And I think it's going to continue, um, you know, so that's what, that's what makes me so excited about all this. But as, as, a, as such a young man, like, and after having that near death experience, was it immediate that you just decided like, fuck this, I gotta, I gotta live for me or, you know, how, what was the next hour next day? Like after that happened, you know, I, um, I remember walking down uh, from the mountain and, you know, it, it was interesting because we had walked off the path. Uh, we had walked off the normal path and we were in a, a place where it was very slippery. And here I was, we slipped down the mountain. Actually, one of my buddies went first, slipped, almost fell. We all kind of laughed. We're like, well, that would have been gnarly. <laughs> uh, and then it was my turn. I actually was falling feet first down the mountain. My friend went to grab me. I had a tank top on and spun me around and couldn't hold on. So now it was going head first off the mountain. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just a, it was a scary situation. And, um, you know, they thought I had died. But, you know, it was that moment where I realized that I need to do what I want to do. Uh, and that I wasn't going to be fulfilled if I was just kind of doing these things that everybody was telling me to do. So there really was this uh, revolution going on inside me after that, where I was just torn. I was like, geez, you know, I, I, did I get married because I wanted to, you know, uh, do I have a job because I want to? Is this what I actually want to do? Do I want to do this so I can go to law school? Is this what really is motivating, motivating me and pushing me and kind of, do I love this? And the answer was no. And I, you know, really tried to uh, make things work and kind of salvage some things. It, it, it didn't go that way. And then I was just kind of at, I, I felt like I was at a crossroads where um, I either needed to start doing what I wanted to do or live a, a life of kind of misery and kind of live the life of somebody else. And as soon as I did that, I didn't have a heck of a lot of money, but I had a hell of a lot of fun. And I knew that I had some kind of love and passion for what I was going to do or what, for what I was doing, where I felt motivated to know or believe that I could do something with this. I, I didn't know what it was at the time, but you know, I, I felt like I had uh, these skills that I needed to improve and, and I was working towards something and, and that gave me meaning. And I think that's what we're all kind of looking for is meaning and you know, you were, you were talking about a little bit, it, it seemed like efficiency, you know, um, I've always been fascinated by that. I, I think there was a book that was a kid that I read called uh, The Keeper by the Dozen, and the father was a, a, an efficiency expert, and he'd always kind of manage and figure out how he can do things in the most efficient manner possible. That's a lot of what Brazilian jiu-jitsu or jiu-jitsu is about, is how can I make movements and be super efficient and also uh, put the onus on my opponent to do all the work? Uh, and you know, if you're thinking about, you know, uh, as far as time is money and what you put your, your energy into and what you want to do with your life, um, money is a huge component of that on, on what you're going to do and how you're going to spend your time. And is that worth it to you? Um, so I think when you really start thinking in those terms um, and you can kind of apply it to other aspects of your life, you're like, this is a key. How do I spend my time doing the things that I want to do? Um, and also be able to get the things or achieve the things or, uh, you know, purchase the things that you want in your life. Yeah. You know, and I think I often ask, you know, pose this question to myself and, and mention it on the podcast, but we, the, you know, we talk about Bitcoin as being freedom money and the, you know, the, 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 the ethos of freedom is such an enormous aspect of this phenomenon. But the question, you know, because of that situation that I mentioned uh, before, like where we're not we're not cultivated or conditioned to really be able to answer the question of what would you do with freedom? Because everything is always dick, like all of our hurdles, all of our tests, everything that we're supposed to be interested in and pursue has been predetermined. Like these are your options. This is what you should, you know, this is the test you have to take. 
And so one, you know, that's, that's kind of the flip side of this freedom coin. It's like, you know, everyone has that visceral desire for freedom, but when you come out of such a restricted world and you're, and you're posed the question like, okay, you got it now, what do you do with it? What's the thing, like you mentioned, meaning, you know, meaning is pretty much the whole game. What's the thing that's going to, that's going to fill you with meaning that's going to fill you with fulfillment. And that's a tough one, right? Because we, we have not, you know, in, in grade school and in high school and stuff, like we've been trained to take tests. We've been trained to be memory banks. We haven't been trained to, to cultivate that, which is uniquely us and, and find a way to monetize or express that in the world. I mean, that's, that's a foreign concept and as is, you know, trying to find, you know, any semblance of meaning. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that your story kind of starts with a near death experience, because I think whether it's a near death experience, whether it's, you know, the, let's say ritual use of psychedelics, whether it's going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, these things can be, you know, in, they can bestow an incredibly different perspective for a time. And that change in perspective allows you to, in a very sober and, and oftentimes uh, unsettling you know, manner, review your life and say, oh, fuck, like, is that, is that what it is? Like, is that the life that I've been living? Because that doesn't really align with something more deep in, inside of me. You know? And um, I, I think that's really interesting that that's how your story came about, but I mean, it begs a question in particular for you. And I like the efficiency angle and I can see why that relates to combat and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, especially. <clears throat> um, was your foray into fighting just that you wanted to see what that potential was inside of you? Like you wanted to see how efficient you could be. You want to see how, you know, how you, how you matched up if you really gave it your all. Yeah, totally. I, you know, I, I think, um, there was this tremendous fear around it. Um, I loved martial arts. I was always fascinated by it. My dad would always talk about, uh, you know, uh, history, but I, more specifically war history, which was always kind of fascinating to me, the different weapons that uh, the, the different combatants would use and That's why awesome. they used it. Um, so I was always intrigued by it. That was kind of the one, one of the ways. My dad was super busy, but that was one of the ways that I would kind of connect with him. I would kind of sit at the table and listen to him talk uh, about those things. Um, so. You know, and the idea of fighting another human being, especially another trained human being, scared the shit out of me, you know, to, to be honest. Uh, and I said, okay, well, how can I combat that in a beautiful way? How would I be able to uh, use my skills to defeat someone who's trying to take my head off? And it was almost like, I want to do this as an experiment. I want to try it once, know that I can do it, and I'm done. That's it. So one became two, two became three, three became four fights. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, I found myself on the first season of The Ultimate Fighter, uh, where they put 16 uh, crazy guys in a house. And, uh, and basically, we would fight in a tournament to determine who would get uh, a contract with UFC. I ended up getting to the finals of my division. It was uh, two weight classes above my natural weight. So I was fighting guys that were way bigger than me. I was fighting guys that were way more experienced than me. I was the smallest guy uh, in, in the house. Was it uh, 180? Was that the weight class? I was 185 pounds. Yeah, 185 Same. pounds. And uh, I got to the finals um, and lost miserably in the final. I got my ass kicked so badly. Who was and it against in the finals? It was against Diego Sanchez. Right, right, right. And... Um, he had cut me really bad. I still have that scar on my, on my nose and it bled into my eyes. I couldn't see anything. And it was just a horrible performance. I remember letting that fear getting the best of me. Uh, and I was focused on the external stuff. I was focused on the contract. I was focused on my friends and family watching. I was focused on all these things that weren't important, all these things that weren't in front of me directly. And I was like a deer in the headlights. And maybe he would have won, you know, anyway but i didn't perform the way i wanted to and that was very unsettling and after that experience i said you know what i i, I need to do way more investigation into my mind and why that happened and how i could what i could do to strengthen that and of course there was a you know th this uh unity that needed to happen between skills and hey john hey buddy we back yeah okay uh yeah my I, my internet just crapped out just oh, no shit. Okay. decided to stop working for a moment. So I thought uh, it was my, on my end. Okay, cool. <laughs> all right. We're, we're, I just fired it up again. So right on. Yeah. I don't know if you remember the train of thought you were on. 
Oh, geez. I, I probably I, I, don't. I, okay. Well, let me, let me frame it up this way because one yeah. of the, you know, I think um, one of the th people love, you know, fighting because it's like a prime, you know, it's primal. It's the oldest sport there ever was. I mean, there's, we have aggression. We, you know, we've, we're warriors. We've settled disputes that way, all that kind of stuff. But I think uh, one of the parallels between Bitcoin and fighting is that it's this like relentless search for truth. And in Bitcoin, I think it's about the truth of Bitcoin itself. I think it's the truth of how the world is uh, structured and how it functions. And, and, you know, probably many other, even more esoteric sort of rabbit holes that you can go down. And with fighting, it's not only the truth of who is the better fighter on that given night, but it's finding a truth about yourself, right? It's, it's really digging down and saying, because we all have such, many of us have, you know, really deluded ideas about ourselves and what we're capable of and how far we can push and all this kind of stuff. And you, you know, especially as guys, you say, well, if push came to shove, you know, I could handle myself, I could protect my family and stuff. And the reality is, is that's unlikely to be true in many respects. And yeah. what I find so, you know, what I think is part of the allure of fighting is that, you know, two people go in and you get to see, you know, they bring to bear as much as they possibly can, their grit, determination, dedication, skill, technique, heart, all of that to see who can who can come out the victor and watching that process unfold in real time is such a compelling thing. And I think it's part of the reason why I've, you know, enjoyed the sport for so long. And I had to imagine someone like yourself, you know, the way I'm hearing you articulate your journey to fighting and your motivations was, you know, because you said you got your, you know, you got beat up a little bit in the, the tough finale was your desire to well, first enter into fighting, but, after that persist and, and, you know, keep going because you, 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 like you knew you were nagged by that kind of concept of like, this is how I really discover a deeper truth about myself. Absolutely. I, I think that whether you like it or not, the truth will reveal itself in combat. And it's, it tells you a lot about who you are. Right. Um, and I didn't like the answer that I got. Uh, and, for me, I, I figured that uh, there was a lot more for me to give, and there was a lot more for me to find out about myself. Um, and also, you know, the idea of truth in um, the technical side of things. You know, are you doing things in the most efficient and effective way possible? Um, what are some of the creative things that you can bring uh, to the space that is going to surprise your opponent or allow you to be successful? So. You know, all those things were, were just fascinating to me. And in the process, I, I learned so much about what I was capable of doing uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, technically. Um, and it, it's one that I still enjoy today, even after being retired for several years. So um, it, it's, it's never ending. That's the thing. I, I think that, um, you know, truth and depth um, is it's a rabbit hole that, that brings you in. Uh, and it's the, a never ending search. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, Krishnamurti before, and <clears throat> I backpacked around South America when I was 22, I think. Uh, and I read a lot of Krishnamurti at the time, and, you know, the, the whole journey of self the discovery, the cliche mm -hmm. bit. But, you know, yeah. what I liked about his approach to philosophy, because I'd always been interested in the subject, is that if I could distill down his approach, it was kind of like, let's not make that assumption. Let's talk about it. You know, so like you make this assertion and he'd say, well, let's let's poke holes in it. Let's see. You know, I don't have the answers. You don't have the answers. But maybe through discussion, we can come to a better approximation of the truth. You know, and I and I think in a in a world and in a life where, you know, so much is handed down to you as gospel, whether or not we're talking about religious doctrine or just, you know, life in general. Uh, I think that, you know, that was a very refreshing approach to me. Um, and help kind of, you know, cultivate my own uh, way of thinking and that kind of stuff. But just along those lines, before we move on, you know, what, since that time, what, ha what other things have you used outside of fighting to develop, you know, that aspect of yourself, you know, the, 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 in, the free thinking Kenny, you know, what, what kind of resources and things have you consulted? Oh, geez, you know, um, I think there's certain people that I've met, um, certain people that I've been inspired by, um, you know, whether it's athletes or uh, innovators or philosophers or creators, you know, I, 
I think uh, looking at those disruptive technologies, for example, of course, Bitcoin and things like that, it gets you to question uh, the current system that you're in. And I think, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, first principles thinking or um, really trying to constantly ask yourself the questions and looking for vulnerabilities in various things and um, being curious uh, just overall, I think is really the ultimate sign of intelligence and not coming into a conversation with, um, you know, or, or doing your best anyway, uh, to not have these preconceptions and to be in the moment as much as possible. And, you know, um, any situation that I can find myself in where it's a little bit scary uh, and anytime I have an opportunity to learn a different skill or learn about a new subject, um, I think it, it kind of gives you that kind of funny feeling in your stomach where you're a little bit nervous. I, those are the kind of moments now that instead of avoiding, I, I kind of uh, run towards. And those those situations kind of excite me now because it's an opportunity for me to, to learn and, and maybe look foolish. And I think that if you're, you know, there, there's a saying, I'm not sure exactly where it's from, but um, it might be Jordan Peterson, actually. And, and he said, uh, it, you can't be a master if you're not, uh, if you're not ready to look like a fool. And mm -hmm. I think those, those moments are the moments that make us human and, and keep us alive and keep us curious and keep us humble as well. Yeah. I, I think that's well put. Speaking of which, uh, got to ask, you know, when you fought uh, Jose Aldo, uh, you know, because all fighters go through a progression in their career and you, you, you yeah. kind of reach your peak and then maybe you plateau and whatever. But, yes. uh, you know, he was a destroyer when you fought him. Right. You know, yeah. I, I, I consider Jose Aldo or Jose Aldo in his prime to be probably the best fighter pound for pound ever. And I know yeah. <clears throat> lots of debate about, you know, that that particular designation, but just in how sharp, how explosive, how powerful, how technically sound he was just the whole package was like the, the perfect fighter. And uh, you fought him, obviously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was that like? What was what was it like, you know, being in the back, knowing that you're going to go in and, and fight this, you know, uh, once in a lifetime sort of fighter? Uh, you know, what was what was going through your mind that night? Absolutely. You know, it, it was it was such an honor and such a experience to fight someone who many people considered you know one of the best if not you know the best pound for pound fighter on the planet at the time and um he was uh extremely uh consistent and dangerous in all aspects and that was super exciting in that process of preparing for someone like that um that was the second time that i would have to uh, cut down to 145 pounds uh which was uh brutal um, and I, I remember right before the fight, I was warming up for about five minutes and uh, my legs started to cramp up. Uh, and it was no doubt from, from the brutal weight cut. And I remember looking at my team and just telling them, guys, I'm done warming up. I want to save everything for the fight. <laughs> and uh, uh, just, just let me be. Let me just focus and breathe. And I'm going to move around super lightly. I'm not going to hit pads. I'm not going to go nuts. I just need to save everything for the fight. Um, and that, that was a little, you know, nerve wracking, uh, because you, you want to have everything uh, for someone like Jose Aldo. And I knew that I wasn't going to have all of my strength and all of my energy due to that brutal weight cut. Um, and, you know, I got out there in the first round. Um, I thought that I won the first round, but I remember there was a point where I kind of was almost about to take his back. He was up, we were up against the cage and I had taken him down and I kind of was on his back a little bit, not with my legs, but with my arms kind of sitting there. And my arms were cramping up so badly. Shit. And I remember just reminding myself, like, it's just the first round, Kenny, chill out. You don't want to expend all your energy. And, um, you know, that was a little bit scary in the first round, knowing that you're already tired. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Uh, and then, you know, he came back, won the second round. I thought he won the third. Uh, I thought I won another round in there. But he ended up winning three rounds to two, at least, in my opinion. Um, I thought that was fair. But it was a close fight. And I ended up going the full 25 minutes, despite feeling like absolute crap. Um, and, yeah, it, it was uh, it was wild. He is – I remember just being ready for his leg kicks. And, and I knew I had to pressure him. I knew I had to, I had to be ready to check those leg kicks. But he was so damn fast. I mean, if you blinked, he was he was kicking you and he was gone. And I remember just being so surprised that I had never seen that kind of speed and that kind of power 
you know, to have that at that size was just uh, mesmerizing in a way. Um, I remember just being blown away by that, but by the amount of power that he was able to create in that leg kick. And uh, I was definitely limping after the fight to the point where my leg was numb for probably several months. Like I lost feeling in some of the nerves in my leg. Yeah, I actually like developed a little ticks. I would like swipe my hand on the inside of my leg. I could not feel my leg for several months. And eventually it came back but that kid is uh he's something special i remember just strength wise he was so powerful at that weight uh just an, an impressive fighter and certainly will go down as, as a legend of the game for sure yeah you know I, I when i watch fighting um and like i've done a little jujitsu but muay thai is more what where i found the most interest for myself and mm. stuff but you know when i watch fighting and when i train myself you know one of the i guess the 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 scary things that a lot of people who don't train can't really appreciate. But when you know that you're getting tired or that like your opponent's got your number, but there's still a hell of a lot of time on the clock. And it's kind of like a helpless feeling. Like you're just kind of there, a lamb to the slaughter and Jose Aldo in particular, because like, if you watch his WEC fight days, you know, you look at his fight with Jonathan Brookins or Uriah Faber, like he yeah. chops your legs out from under you to such an extent that you can't use them. And like you just said, yes. I mean, possibly for several months thereafter, but it must be, you know, that's the, that's the thing that I find so fascinating because you're there, you know, he's got your number, you know, you can't move and you still got to like psychologically steal your emotions and try to like go through that like really quick hierarchy of decision-making to be like, what's my, what's the best course of action here. And that's what, what, you know, why fighting is so compelling to me because it's those, you know, it's, it's such an emotional game and you've got to steal those emotions to try to, you know, still bring to bear whatever assets you have available to try to navigate the situation best, you know, a hundred percent. And even in, in that regard, you know, most people, what happens is if you get kicked in the leg and you start to back up and you like you, you realize that you can't go forward anymore, that's actually way worse for you because now he knows that you're hurt. And go, if he's able to move forward and leg kick you, it's going to be that much worse. Where in reality, if you're getting kicked in the leg, you want to put him on his back foot. So you actually have to go into the fire repeatedly, in my opinion, and, and kind of pressure still. Um, because it will only get worse if you start to back up. So you actually have to do the opposite of what your mind wants to do. You know, it's like you want to quit. You want to go backwards. You want to kind of stop doing it. And you actually have to do all those things. You have to do all these things that are contrary to what your mind and body wants to do. So, yeah, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, last last question about fighting. But um, speaking of leg kicks, uh, the Conor McGregor and... Uh, Put up Dustin Poirier. Dustin Poirier, sorry. Yes. Dustin Poirier fight recently. Thoughts on uh, on that whole fight? It was amazing. You know, uh, Dustin uh, exposed um, what I think was a big weakness in, in Conor McGregor. And, and Conor McGregor is such a fantastic fighter, but so much of it uh, comes from his footwork, his movement, his fainting. And it seemed like he was just prepared for a boxing fight. Uh, and Dustin Poirier eventually ended up adapting and uh, was kicking out the leg of Conor McGregor. Um, and, you know, typically you kick the inside of the quad or you kick the outside of the quad. And in the last probably maybe seven years, five years, uh, really it's gained in popularity. The last three years it's really come on the scene. They're using that leg kick in the form of a calf kick. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's difficult to deal with in a couple different reasons, for a couple different reasons. It's hard to check because if you go to block it with your leg, it actually can be used as a sweep to take you out from under your feet. Um, you can't really block it very well um, because it's so low to the ground um, that it, it's hard to react to um, and harder to see. Uh, and it also affects your ability, your foot's ability to kind of dorsiflex or flex. And um, it puts so much pressure and pain every time you step that a, you, can, you can literally kick someone in the calf once properly and the fight just might be over. It's that bad. If you prevent someone from moving in the way that they want, you now control where they where they can go in the octagon. And that's essentially what Dustin did. Connor basically had to back himself up against the octagon cage and stay there and hope that he landed a shot against Dustin because he knew he couldn't move anymore. And from there, you know, being in that range with four ounce gloves, it's not a good idea. You need to be able to move in, get in and get out. 
Um, but when you're working with four ounce gloves, anytime you're in that boxing range and you're standing and trading, you're throwing the dice. It, you, you, you know, I could be facing Mike Tyson. If I land one good shot, maybe not me, but if I, you land one good shot, even against Mike Tyson, he might be vulnerable, especially with four ounce gloves. And Connor basically didn't utilize all of his skills, didn't utilize his versatility. And this is not to take away from Dustin Poirier's performance, but it was Dustin that won that fight. Make no mistake about it. Um, but it was Dustin that really made the better uh, adaptations and, and used the better tactics in that fight. And, uh, and Dustin defeated Connor in, in, uh, in dramatic fashion in the second round. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it was a great mixed martial arts performance by Dustin. And, you know, people just don't realize how much those calf kicks hurt. And not, it's not just like a, like you, uh, it's not just a stinging pain. Like you get hit in the face and it, it stings and hurts, yeah. but it doesn't radiate really. Like yes. it, it jumbles you up a little bit and it stings. But like when you get kicked in the calf and the thigh, but you know, the calf, especially it radiates a weakness, like up and down your leg that you just, it, it, you, you can't do anything about it. And you're like, why can't I put any weight on this anymore? Why can't I move this fucking thing anymore? So absolutely. Uh, yeah, but it, it you know all all praise to both guys for being in there and they're phenomenal yeah. fighters. But it it was a bit strange that the you know there wasn't as many adjustments as you might think there would be from Connor's side of things. And it and it mm -hmm. it, it kind of seemed like he was loading up and whiffing on the left. And it seemed like that was as much as he was talking about before all the shots he's got and you know this and that seemed like he was just hunting for the the big left. And you know I guess at that level and it's kind of like. Aldo, right? Like once people figured out the leg kicks and he lost a fraction of a second of, of his timing, all those leg kicks kind of petered out from being like the big threat of his game. And he had to kind of fight a normal fight with guys. And he's been in a lot of wars as a result. I think it's maybe something similar with Connor. I mean, you figure out how 100%. to fight the left and, you know, he becomes a more human sort of fighter. Absolutely. I think that's what makes it so difficult to, to become a champion and stay a champion in the UFC is everyone is figuring out ways to defeat you. Everyone is figuring out your vulnerabilities. Um, and that blueprint just gets more and more precise over time. You know, you could see what works, what doesn't work if you're coming up in the game. And uh, it, it just goes to show you, if you're not getting better in combat, you're getting worse. And you have to constantly look for ways to reinvent yourself and and, and improve and, and, and come up with new and, and different uh, techniques and skills. Yeah. And, you know, to Connor's credit and along the lines of what we've been talking about, you get beat in the most dramatic fashion on the biggest stage and you pick yourself up and you say, yeah, I got beat and I'm going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to try to get better. And just that attitude is, uh, and Connor takes his losses so well. I think that's part of the reason really that, that, that his fans are, you know, he endears so many people to him. And I think it's a great example to lead. Like you were saying earlier, if you're not willing to make mistakes, look foolish, all that kind of stuff, then you're never going to learn. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin or fighting or anything else in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Elon Musk, Bitcoin in the profile. Let's let's get to it. What are your uh, initial thoughts? You know, I, 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 uh, I figured as much, you know, I, I assume this is more than trolling. I assume this is much more than him having fun with the, with the current environment that we're in. Um, I, I, I would assume that he is uh, into Bitcoin and has bought Bitcoin and is kind of letting the world know what's up. Um, and, and at the very least, he's letting other people know that maybe you should get involved with this. Maybe you should do some investigation and find out what Bitcoin is all about. Um, and with this backdrop with the GameStop thing and Robinhood and all these things, um, I think I find it so interesting that uh, it's the external things around Bitcoin and not Bitcoin itself that is bringing people into Bitcoin. You know, it, it, that's what's stronger than that. What's better than that is that, you know, when you can give all these examples and show people that your money isn't your money and that these guys have been winning the game and been screwing you for a long time. Uh, what's the exit? The exit's Bitcoin. And yeah, it, it's, it's almost a, a, it's a beautiful time to be alive and to witness this. And <laughs> You know, when you see, you know, not only Elon Musk, but all these other brilliant people in the space and and how they're, you know, investing their money in Bitcoin and their belief in Bitcoin and you get someone else like an Elon Musk involved. I mean, these are these are some of the most successful business people in the world. And it's only a matter of time where others will follow and, and, and others will see the light. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I 
when when so much is predicated on the falsehood of how our money is created, produced, distributed, controlled, all you know, central banking, that all that jazz. Um, when, and everything that emerges on top of that in society, in terms of institutions, structures, the incentives, like you know, it, people really, and they are starting to, which is which is great. And there's been so much great output in the Bitcoin space to help people understand the influence of money on damn near everything else in in society. Um, but what, you know, when you start to realize wherever you are in that spectrum of how things are influenced by that false money, when you realize the lie. It's almost like all roads lead to the, the, the same truth, right? Because if it's that one fundamental mechanism that's causing all this distortion and delusion and you know whacked incentives and stuff like that, then you know that that bright orange thing on the horizon is just saying like this fixes a lot of that, you know. And whether it's you're dissatisfied with the intervention in stock, you know, in in legacy markets over the last few days, or you start to realize that you know inflation is keeping you on the hamster wheel longer, or you're someone who, you know, feels strapped to your home country because of capital controls or whatever, or you're someone who's thinking about your balance sheet in a hundred years as a business and, you know, cash is your melting ice cube. Like, you know, this thing that Bitcoin represents, like you said, I mean, it's not so much that people are really uh, like understanding Bitcoin and seeing the light on it versus just out of necessity, looking at, at, at the kind of, degrading legacy system and legacy world and saying, man, this sucks. Is there an alternative? And, you know, it, I remember thinking that, you know, in my early twenties and piecing together this world, and I was a critic of central banking and all that kind of stuff back then. And basically just being, you know, and gold was the only option. So, you know, I was a gold bug, but gold changed nothing. Central banks own most of the gold. They'd already mm -hmm. shown that, you know, they could detach, you know, paper currencies from gold. And so it, it was a kind of a, a hopeless, uh, you know, hopeless feeling. And I, I lost myself for a little while, just, you know, trying to figure out a way forward and trying to accept that, you know, accept that thing that I really didn't want to accept. And I, I, it's so great now that whatever age you are, but particularly if you're a young person, you're coming out in the world and you're saying this, like you, you know, like you were saying when you had your near death experience, whether it's in relation to yourself or the world that you see around you and you say, this doesn't really feel right like there's it feels like there's a lot that's going on that is not right that shouldn't be happening this way and to you know have already in existence such a powerful solution that that, that now you can easily just say oh I've, I've i've identified the problem that thing over there seems like a damn fine attempt at in a solution and just and not go through that kind of you know this period of despair and just go right to that and say you know what the peop the way people are talking about this the the way the community are, is expressing themselves my understanding of all of, all of the things surrounding this i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to lean into that a little bit and i you know it seems like on every scale people are starting to do that and what a what a phenomenon what a time to have a front row seat to all this absolutely Absolutely. You know, I think a lot of those neon signs are now pointing towards Bitcoin, which is really exciting. And, you know, I, I think there was a, a huge aha moment uh, when, when you realized that you could actually separate money from the state. And, you know, the, the way that uh, the central banks kind of control us or, or, or running the, the monetary system, it, it's similar to what I try to do in jujitsu, right? Uh, when I'm rolling with someone or training with someone or fighting someone, I try to get them to do as much work as possible. And I just kind of lean on them the whole time. I let them carry my weight. I let them get exhausted. I let them move like a maniac. And meanwhile, I'm just making little movements and I'm letting them carry my weight until they're exhausted or they're you know, unable to deal with the techniques that I'm throwing at them. And ultimately they turn their back, they give me uh, that position and I choke them or I submit them. That's kind of what's happening is when you realize that there's this oppressive system where only the guys at the very top are able to win and they're putting all this pressure on us and we're working harder to gain less and then they're dragging us into this system of borrowing money and all this stuff to keep up with all the printing that's going on. Um, you realize it's very difficult to win in that situation unless you create an other system and Bitcoin has been that answer. Uh, for a while, um, I think it, it, it's taken people a little bit to, to become aware of it. It's growing every single day. 
uh, and I think this whole event is, I think, a great thing for people to realize uh, what kind of situation we're in. You know, it, I think we we get blinded uh, by our uh, by our situation, and we think that hey, this is just the way it's going to be. Or if you are aware of these things, you, you think, well, I, I don't know of any other solution. This is this is just the way the world works, man, and and we got to figure it out. But um, there is an answer, and I think it's going to change uh, a lot of different things in the next five to ten years. This is revolutionary, and uh, people are starting to wake up. Yeah, I, I think it, you know, it, it's so great that it hijacks your greed, you know, because it, as you say, it's so most people like I, I pick, you know, kind of picking up that you've always been a thoughtful, sort of curious person, myself included, and a lot of early Bitcoin people would naturally be in, in that category. But so many people just, as you said, accept things the way they are. Well, this is how things are. So, and it's it's pragmatic. Like I'm going to operate in the domain that I find myself in. But um, I I think Bitcoin pulls a lot of people in. You know, with greed, they see the charts, they see the number go sure. up. My situation could be different. And then when you start learning, it's almost like it is a parallel system, but it creates a parallel perception, or or it starts to change your perception of how everything works, the economics, politics, you know, yes, all of that stuff. And when you, you know, talking about having such a dramatic change in perspective, like we said earlier, with the near death experiences or psychedelics or fighting, whatever, this, and Bitcoin, this again, you look and now, I mean, I, you know, a lot of us in the Bitcoin space are very big critics of the current economic and political paradigm. And I, I think, you know, I, I say this quite often, uh, I think history will be extremely unkind to uh, this era in terms of what kind of egregious infringements on on freedom and all the downstream effects of this concentration of power and wealth and this ability to surreptitiously steal time from every human being on the planet by these institutions. Uh, history is going to be very unkind to the people that just accepted that and, and didn't see it, you know, kind of like the way we look at slavery today, where we say, like, how could those people back then have, um, you know, have accepted, you know, the fact that, you know, so many people own, own slaves, let's say, slaves, let's say, and, like, on the one hand, I'm sympathetic, because when you're locked into a certain paradigm, you know, it's, it's, it can be very difficult to see outside of it. But um, now that this thing is pulling everybody outside of it, and it's just, it's washing away a lot of the the misconceptions and misinformation and false perceptions that we have about our world. And it's bringing a high degree of clarity to all these things. I mean, that's when it really smacks you and say, Oh my God, I like things are really in a, in a bad way. And this thing seems like a, a really powerful force to set a lot of it straight. And we need to give our time and our energy and our life force and our savings to this thing use it properly, like, you know, gain as much benefit as we can from it and what it allows and bring about that world uh, that we think is possible because, you know, the one that, that we've been operating in, even without our resistance to it, seems like it's, you know, degrading rapidly. Without a question. And I think, uh, you know, one of the best ways to, to be effective uh, in combat or in various things, I think, is to do things surreptitiously, to do things silently, um, and, you know, to not even realize that you're being oppressed, to not even realize that you're stuck in the system uh, gives power, uh, gives so much more power to those that are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the beautiful thing about the internet is that we have the ability now to communicate these things, to share these thoughts, to get people uh, to understand and see what's going on. And um, I mean, obviously, <laughs> the, the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin runs on the internet, but all the information that's surrounding Bitcoin is, is happening with, you know, podcasts like you and, you know, getting people to, to wake up and see what's happening and to educate people. I mean, I've learned more. Uh, and, and that's another benefit of, of the pandemic. I mean, I've learned so much more about Bitcoin because I've had the time to be at home and to study and research and and that's one thing I would just urge people to do. If you're on the fence or you're unsure, you're not, um, you know, so sure of what's going on or what the system's like or what Bitcoin's about, do the research and do it with an open mind. Just keep asking questions. And there's so much great information out there. And, and now a lot of people have the time to do it. Yeah. You know, I think what's been great about Bitcoin thus far is it's been a wealth transfer to the curious and the open-minded, right? And those are the people you want to have wealth because they're yeah. curious and open-minded. They're open to new ideas and new ways yes. of thinking and new ways of doing things. 
And, you know, it, it makes me, when I see people like Ray Dalio somewhat capitulating in, in his letter yesterday, still, you know, he, he, he thinks that the MySpace Facebook argument seems to be nestled within his capitulation. But, right. you know, I, th I think he'll eventually come around. And then to see the richest man in the world, uh, you know, put it in his profile. And it, it's exciting, but it makes me a little bit sad because the, the window for the little guy and, you know, those people that haven't really gotten on board yet, for it to be a, a, a you know a kind of forcing function for dramatic life change, you know circumstance change for them is is maybe closing. So like I, I shed a little bit of a tear for the you know sure. the moving out of the early adopter phase and having all you know the the big names uh, start to wake up to this, but that's the way it goes. I mean we've had twelve years to to look at this and you know you got to take responsibility for your own uh, life and behavior at some point, right? A absolutely, you know I. I, I couldn't agree more, um, but I also think it's still early, and yeah, people are always sure. going to be looking at the price. You know, you know, I had some family members that had got in at like fifty-eight dollars. You know, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know, and now you know people are oh, four thousand is too high, or you know, nine thousand is too high, and eleven thousand is too high. Like they're going to keep saying that. You know, the more you can buy any amount of Bitcoin. Like I think that's one of it. It seems silly, but people don't. I don't think they realize that. They can buy any amount of Bitcoin they want. You can make hundred dollar, you know, uh, you know, investments every week if you want, and do the dollar co cost averaging thing, or you know, buy a little bit and accumulate over time. And um, but yeah, it, it's it, it's pretty wild. I, I also think that people are going to start scratching their head. They're going to go, wait a sec. If the richest guy in the world, Elon Musk, uh, one of the most brilliant people in our generation is now putting their money into Bitcoin, maybe I should look into it, you know? Uh, and I think that's what, you know, Michael, Michael Saylor has done, you know, with his company. It's like, he believes in it so much and he can explain it so well. And you, you realize that the guy is absolutely uh, brilliant. You're like, well, there's gotta be something to it. You know, uh, maybe I should look into this as well. Yeah. It's getting increasingly hard <clears throat> to be a skeptic. You know, you really got to kind of have your head in the sand uh, you know, and people are busy and they have all the stresses of that life yeah. brings. And so that's part of the reason why people don't don't dig in. And and by the way, I didn't mean the ship is sailing for people like I think we're just at the beginning of this thing. Yeah, yeah I yeah. just mean as far as it being like a wealth transfer to the curious versus sure. finding the pockets of people that already have, you know, a lot of money. Maybe that dynamic is starting to slow down. But man, yes. we we are so incredibly early in this process that, um, you know, and it even 20 years from now, it's still, you know, I, I consider Bitcoins to Bitcoin to be my savings account. You know, I don't want to hold paper money if, if I'm talking about saving for anything longer than a year or something, you Absolutely. know, so, so uh, I, I think it's the, 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 there's going to always be a strong case. Um, what I find interesting about Bic, uh, or about Elon, um, you know, maybe coming onto Bitcoin now is one of the, and I love talking about this because, you know, I, I I say kind of maybe ad nauseum that, you know, for something to be revolutionary, the only way in which it is revolutionary is if it changes behavior. I mean, that's changes in behavior is what revolutions are, right? If we don't change right. our behavior, then what changes? All there is, is how we act and interact. And um, Bitcoin has been such a fascinating phenomenon in how people change as a result of coming into it and learning about it and understanding it. And yeah. in, in ways that are almost exclusively beneficial, save for maybe checking the price of Bitcoin too much and spending a little too much time on Twitter, right? Like that might maybe not be the a positive thing in people's lives, but in terms of their health, their, their hopefulness for the future, you know, their relationship with their loved ones and their family, there's a, you know, maybe desire to start a family, uh, open-mindedness, education about how the world, like across the board, the really positive changes. And what's exciting is, and I think that has to do with big, you know, Bitcoin's nature, what it represents, and then all the different ways in which it, it, it has the potential to change things. And so I'm excited that, you know, even guys like uh, Elon and, you know, people in positions of, of, of great power, maybe this thing, you know, will, will have, I mean, Michael Saylor is a great example. I mean, he had everything, right. He's, you know, because you could be led to believe like maybe people just change because they're being freed financially and they don't have to worry about, you know, going right. nine to five. But here, here's a guy with six yachts and however many houses and airplanes. And, you know, so money wasn't really a concern for him. 
but somehow interacting with this network has produced really dramatic changes in how he expresses himself and how he sees the future and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really excited for that aspect of getting into these legacy minds that may be a little bit entrenched and maybe a little bit, you know, trying to preserve the system that's only serving a very small group of people. And maybe that starts to change their mind about things. But I'd be interested in hearing from your perspective, you know, obviously someone who's inquisitive and inquisitive and thoughtful like yourself, how has Bitcoin, you know, learning about Bitcoin influenced your perspective, changed your life, changed your motivations, anything like that? Oh my God. Um, it, it's done so in, in, in a lot of different ways. You know, um, I think it's, it's given me, you know, when I first learned about it, it kind of, same thing. I kind of get those butterflies in my stomach and that almost nervousness and that unease where I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so different. And this is truly disruptive. There's got to be something to it. Let me investigate it and then, you know, see if it's the best. And I certainly didn't go all in from the beginning and, and, and wasn't as uh, bullish as I was, as I am now. But, um, you know, it, it is like this uh, long journey and it takes you in many different paths. There's the, there's the what is money journey. Um, there is what is the current system like uh, journey. Uh, there is what, what, what does this mean for me personally? And what does this mean for my family type of journey? Um, and it, it, it just permeates into all aspects of, of your life. Why? Because we can't do anything without monetary energy. We can't do anything um, effective uh, without it. And you talk about your retirement and, you know, uh, whether it's college education for your kids or, you know, what kind of future you want to see. And, you know, it, it's, it is something that, um, is constantly kind of changing the way that I think about things and the way that I see things. Um, you know, the value of saving money, you start quite like, am I going to sell my Bitcoin for a car that I really want? No, it's, you know, like, I, I don't care what car it is. I, I love it. I, I love cars. I'm a huge car guy. I love Porsches and I want to have them all. But as far as <laughs> how, I, how I value Bitcoin, that's one, one of my vices, but how I value Bitcoin, I'm not selling my Bitcoin for an amazing car that I wanted. Why? Because I, I see the potential in it and I, um, I see what it could bring me and my family in the future. So I'm, I'm going to be willing to hold on to that and uh, hope for a better system in the future. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of view it as, as my savings account as well, my retirement account as well. I, um, I just see so much potential um, for myself and, and for something that goes beyond me. And I think that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day is like, what did you do with your life and what did you do um, to carry on that certain amount of legacy or, or, or what kind of opportunities are, now, are you now providing uh, or teaching or leaving for your kids uh, and their kids? So, yeah, it's, there, there's been a lot of depth uh, from Bitcoin and it's changed my life. I mean, it's like anytime someone brings it up, it's like, uh, you know, I, I'm like a dog with my ears come up and I'm like, Oh, you want to talk Bitcoin? Let's do this. Uh, and I think that's, that's what happens with a lot of us. Oh my God. Does it ever, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Bitcoin seems to instill, you know, among other things, and I, you can't generalize to everybody, but these, these ideas of having a extending out your time preference and thinking beyond even your own life into your kid's life and your grandkids life, it seems to instill or align with a lot of kind of stoic, uh, you know, concepts. Um, and, you know, as does martial arts, obviously. And yeah. wondering, you know, I was going to ask, first of all, how has being involved in Bitcoin changed the nature of your social interactions? As you said, like, you know, are you always kind of chomping at the bit to talk about it? But in particular with people in the fight world, um, whom, you know, I, yeah, I mean, what, what's been the nature of the discussions you've had with people in that world and how, you know, how much interest has there been? Geez, you know, um, it, it, it's been, it's been interesting. You know, I, I've gotten, I, it's gone from everywhere from like arguments to, you know, convincing people to everything in between. Um, you know, martial arts and fighting is one of those things where you realize uh, the value of time and you realize um or hopefully you realize how much you're worth, you know, uh, we, we have one brain, we have one body. And for me, I, I never had um, the style where I was willing to take uh, three shots to give one. That just, that didn't make sense to me 
because uh, I'm, I'm trying to preserve myself. It's self-defense, not self-offense. So my first goal was how do I preserve myself? How do I um, take the least amount of damage as possible and gain the most uh, from those situations? Uh, and, and how do I become efficient in that process? Um, and, you know, for a lot of these guys that are sacrificing their bodies, I mean, there's the Spencer Fisher story. He was, a, you know, a mixed martial arts fighter back in kind of my generation, and he was involved in some of the most epic wars, and he was a fan favorite. Now people don't know who he is, and this guy's just, you know, unfortunately uh, just trying to get by and trying to pay his bills now. Um, you know, he sacrificed, he put his body on the line. And now he has nothing to show for it, which is a horrible situation. And it happens in, in, with a lot of athletes, guys that have won, you know, or that have gained hundreds of millions of dollars. We've seen those guys go bankrupt from foolish decisions or keeping the wrong people around them. But if you're talking about getting the most for what you're doing and, and something like fighting where you're not only sacrificing your brain and body in when you perform, but you're doing that when you train as well. And you're doing that almost incessantly, right? Um, so why shouldn't you have some kind of backup plan or have the ability to truly save your money and not have that be diluted? I mean, that, that's horrible. If I went and told you, hey, hey, man, good job fighting for the last 10 years. Everything you just owned, everything you just earned is gone or 50% of that is gone. All those fights, all those times that you took shots, all those injuries um, were for nothing. That, that's that's a horrible place to be in. And, you know, it's not only for people who are sacrificing their body like NFL players and mixed martial arts fighters. It's for anybody. Time is money. And, you know, they're sucking out that life force from you. And uh, it, that's 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 never a good place to be. This is the kind of stuff that starts revolutions. You know, when you realize not only are they leaning on you, but they have their boot on your neck. Mm -hmm. And that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, fighters and normal people, they approach this and they say, well, I, I don't know anything about investing and I don't know anything about technology, so it's probably not for me. And, you know, the, I guess the comeback would be like, yeah, but how do you feel about freedom? You know, how do you feel about owning the fruits of your labor? How do you feel about not being stolen from, you know? Uh, and I think maybe that hits a little bit closer to home uh, with people. Uh, but, you know, I, and, I ha and how about in your, in your normal social reactions? Like you mentioned, your ears kind of perk up when people mention it. Did you go through a phase where you had to try not to talk about it because you were like going at it too much or did you not have, did you not get that far with it? Like what was the, the journey of, of preaching the gospel like for you? I'm not sure I'm out of that phase, John, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anytime I have the opportunity to talk about it, I love, it's just fascinating to me uh, and, I, and I love educating people the best that I can about it. Um, but, uh, and also, you know, if you want to, if you truly want to learn something, you teach it. Uh, so I, I love talking about it. But, you know, for example, you know, I have a brother, one of my brothers, um, you know, who I've been trying to teach about it. And he's been very resistant and um, has, hasn't really gotten on board uh, yet. But um, I, I think this recent uh, event is kind of getting him to kind of scratch his head and think a little bit harder about. Oh, uh, really? It just took is. the yeah. richest man in the world to say, I'm into Bitcoin for you to fucking, you know, give it a second look. Tell me about it, man. So anyways, <laughs> I've been, you know, doing my best to, you know, tell family members about it. And really the, the people I care about, you know, like that, that's the, the first people that I, I want to see, um, you know, utilize the, the technology and, and get tapped into it. So um, you know, my close friends, my family members, um, some that have been receptive, some that, that haven't. Uh, I've had a lot of phone calls over the last, uh, you know, I guess 12 months that have said, dude, this Bitcoin thing, yeah, I think you're right about it. You've been talking about this for a long time. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I have. But uh, so sometimes I, I, I get angry and, and I've, I've definitely had some arguments and some fights about it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, it's like people are going to believe what they're going to believe. And I, I, again, I urge people for anything just to um, be curious and, and, and come into it with an open mind and really do the work. Don't regurgitate what you see on, you know, CNBC or, or some stupid article from some major media, whatever it is, you know, people are trying to talk down the price or trying to ruin this thing that threatens their system. Um, you know, and I was talking about this the other day, you know, when I, when I want to buy a car at the price that I want it, 
I'm not talking about why I want to buy it. I'm talking about why I don't want to buy it. I'm talking about the scratches in the car. This isn't exactly the color that I want. And eventually, you know, hopefully they concede and I get the price that I wanted at. And, you know, there's this game that's happening all the time. And um, I think more than anything else, if you're going to get involved in Bitcoin and what I tell people is think long term. This isn't about, you know, yeah. following the price every day. Uh, that is way too difficult and way too stressful. This is about creating a new future. This is where the future is heading, um, and you better get in now. Yeah, I, I think as that's, quickly as possible. I think that's great advice because that's the first thing people go to. It's like, well, I'm going to wait for the price to pull back, or how should I deploy all this? And it's like, stop. You know, stop thinking in that way. It's a savings account. Siphon in whatever you can afford on a regular basis, and don't even think about it. Make sure it's secure, and just yeah. go about your life because. You know, and I think that's good. A lot of Bitcoiners have to come to grips with that as well, because uh, it, it can take over a lot of your mental capacity. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's supposed to be freeing. Right. So yeah. knowing that your life force or your savings or however you want to characterize it is safe, secure and even appreciating over a long period of time means that you can go forth and express yourself and articulate yourself and do whatever else in whatever other domains without having to think about the the time and the you know the energy suck of you know people's leeching and uh, on your on your savings so you know that's I, I usually say to people like don't you're not a trader don't try to be a trader get in tuck it away tight and 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 don't think about it you know and um, absolutely but but as you said I don't think you can convince people like as I like every now and then I, I can be fairly articulate, you know, uh, if I'm in a good, you know, in a good mood and I'm, and I'm jiving well, but no amount of smooth talking or, or convincing is going to get to people. Like, I think the best thing you can do is tell people, Hey, I'm into this. And when you reach that point where you want more information, I'm happy to, you know, be a resource because, and, and number go up is what's going to bring 99% of people in. So. I, 100%, I, I, man. I, it's interesting. You know, I think that it, Kind of the same way when I teach jujitsu or I'm teaching something, um, I've found that maybe a conceptual approach is best because if you could teach them about the concepts behind it and teach them about the, the conceptual framework for what the current monetary system is like and what it does, um, it, it almost allows them to investigate and then learn from themselves. And I find that's always the best way to do it. Some people are going to be receptive. You tell them exactly what what's what. And they get it. And they're like, okay, wow, it, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And eventually, they they go and do it. But I think it's a slower process, but I think it's a stronger process when you kind of teach them the fundamentals, you teach them the concepts behind it, and they end up realizing that uh, you know that is the way that that Bitcoin makes way more sense. And especially given you know um, you know the game theory that surrounds it, I think over time, people are going to realize. You know, just like fighting, sometimes uh, you, you got to join in the fight, uh, you know, to, to try to battle something that is that strong where uh, everyone's kind of getting into it. You're going to realize it's it's way easier to be involved and be a part of it than to fight. it. Um, and I think that's what's going to happen over the next five to 10 years. It's going to be uh, a situation where um, you're way better being a part of the network than you are uh, trying try to stop it. Yeah. And I think that works on every level and you know a lot is made of trying to time the hyper bitcoinization event you know and mm -hmm. i just part maybe it's because of covid you know covid in many domains seems to have accelerated timelines you know of of many kinds mm -hmm. and i wonder if you know it's, it's hard to imagine this genie being kept in the bottle um you know for another 10 years and for it to take that long i mean I feel like we're in an accelerated period where, you know, all this could happen quickly. And, you know, and that kind of brings up the question, well, does that make the transition more tumultuous or more contentious? And, you know, I'm wondering from your perspective, fighter, adversarial thinker, that kind of thing, like, do you give much thought to, you know, obviously you're placing your resources in this parallel system, let's say, and you're, you're leveraging that, but do you give much thought to what the world around you looks like now and into the period where things kind of change over? And if so, what kind of, uh, you know, actions do you take to mitigate yours and your family's, you know, uh, risks there? 
Yeah. Um, so you mean specifically as far as, you know, uh, my positions in Bitcoin or how, how I see that in the future or? Well, I, 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 you know, we, we often talk about like, what does the transition look like, you know, to go mm -hmm. from this legacy fiat world oh, right. to, you know, Bitcoin world. And, uh, you were talking about capitulation. It could be the case that all the powers that be right. just decide there's no sense in fighting this, let's capitulate. But so if that could not happen and simultaneously, like all the people, you know, the social issues that will emerge from such a dramatic change. And we're seeing a lot of social, you know, upheaval now. And a lot of Bitcoiners are, you know, thinking about the Citadel sort of narrative, whether that's a place or it's in your mind. Like, how do you think about navigating the, what seems to be an increasingly, you know, tumultuous world? Yeah, you know, I think that we're at a point now where there is probably more distrust of the media uh, than there's ever been. Um, and people are kind of catching on to that in, in various ways, no matter what side you're on. Um, there is this kind of, uh, what are you guys talking about? Or, or, you know, you're looking at the facts or what you think are the facts and seeing a completely different narrative. Um, so I, I think it's causing people to do their own research and do their own work. And um, I do think it's going to take some time, certainly, for people to, uh, you know, adopt a whole new system. But uh, I, I think when you realize that you can be your own bank and actually become uh, a new bank for others in the future to be able to deliver money wherever you want all over the world um, very quickly or large amounts, um, I, I think when large, other large businesses and other people realize that there, there is this switch of power, um, I think that also gets people to see things in a, in a different light. And I see, um, you know, people seeing that opportunity and seeing this um, massive transfer of, of power and control, I think, uh, I think it gets people to, uh, look at things in a, in a very different way. And um, I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. And, and uh, this hyper -bit Bitcoinization, I, I don't know um, exactly when, when that's going to happen. But I, I do think that when you look at all the pluses of Bitcoin and whatever negatives it has compared to the, the current system, I mean, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, and, you know, like the United States, uh, you know, if we are this you know, country that believes in freedom, um, you know, we should be at the forefront of it and pushing this narrative and, and pushing Bitcoin. I mean, it's it's about as, as free as I, I know as far as a monetary system and, and um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's really gonna put uh, to the test how much, you know, the powers would be, our leaders, et cetera, believe in those principles of, of freedom uh, in, in you know in relation to how they respond to something like bitcoin because I, I couldn't agree with you more that it, it literally embodies those things and it permits each individual to uh, establish them in their life and it will be interesting and 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 hopefully the more clear that becomes and maybe we all have a role to play in articulating that the harder it will be for those people that would seek to disallow people from accessing that that degree of freedom and accessing those principles the more obvious that will become and the more it will reveal, it will pull down the facade of, that a lot of, you know, people in the political world seem to get on with these days. Definitely. I think that, um, you know, with, a, with anything that's highly technical uh, and, and something that needs to be explained, I think the best approach for people in the beginning is to kind of look at it as a philosophy really, and, and see the competing philosophy that's at play and, and uh, then you can kind of get into the technical side of things. Um, I kind of did it in reverse, which was why I think my, maybe my process of uh, adopting Bitcoin and, and being all about it took a little bit longer than normal and maybe, uh, but um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think when you understand the, the competing philosophies, I think it's going, that alone is going to make people more curious. And, uh, and then when you talk about all the, you know, the efficiencies of both systems and, you know, for anyone who's done business, you know, I, I have, um, I had two gyms now I only have one. Um, and, you know, I buy jujitsu geese and, you know, different uniforms and buy, buy stuff from uh, Pakistan and, you know, uh, wiring money and getting things done and having to wait through all that whole process is so inefficient and takes so long and it costs money. And, 
you know, just just that aspect alone, as far as Bitcoin and what it does, you know, make things so much more uh, efficient and easier. But you know, it, it's it's going to happen in, in, in many different ways, and um, you know, Bitcoin does does so much. It really is extremely versatile. Yeah, I, I think about you know the existing currency system as all these different silos, right? That are, that there's so much kind of data loss when they and 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 uh, in, impedance and interruption in the, in the speed of things when they try to communicate. And Bitcoin just lifts up all of those silos and allows people to communicate their economic behavior uh, far more pristinely than ever before and far more quickly and. And without um, <clears throat> without that data loss, that is, you know, corruption and inflation and that kind of stuff. And man, it's an exciting time. One one last question, which I meant to ask you earlier, but have you gotten Anik on board yet? He's on board. Okay. Yeah, he is on. Okay, he's on board. Good. He's a part of the team. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, if you didn't get him, you know, we'd have to question you persuasively. Exactly. Exactly. We got him. We got him. Nice. Well, Kenny, man, uh, this has been awesome. Uh, really appreciate you making the time. It's, I've, like I said at the beginning, I've been a long time fan. It's been a pleasure to get to jam with you a little bit. Any uh, last remarks before we shut this down? John, I've been a fan of your podcast, so thank you so much for having me on and doing what you do in the space and. Um, yeah, that, that's it. You know, I, I have a new YouTube channel. If you guys want to check it out where I'm teaching, uh, you know, different martial arts techniques and stuff on there. Um, so just started that about a month and a half ago and, um, you know, uh, doing battle bots on discovery channel right now and, um, doing the, uh, Anakin Florian podcast with Mr. John Anik. And, uh, that's it, man. Hopefully, uh, getting people on board with, with Bitcoin one at a time. So awesome, man. Well, look, uh, all the best. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk again in the future. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. See you, buddy.